afternoon, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Redeeming the Time. I'm your host, Chris Macy, and I'm so glad you could be with me uh, this this afternoon. Well, uh, today's the day. I'm finally going to finish the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, the rest of verses from verses 13 to the very end of the chapter. And, um, well, a part of all of this is uh, been, been mainly just I, I love working through the, the scriptures expositorily. And uh, I said last week I was going to have a, another brother on. I went down to his uh, office. We were going to record a couple of episodes, and my recorder wire failed. I could not get it to work. So I bought a new one. It is working, and we are scheduled for, for Thursday to, to sit down with uh, Brother Keith Shepherd from the Amistool Road Church of Christ. And I'm looking forward to that. We'll get those uh, two episodes recorded. We'll be looking at uh, does God uh, punish man with disease, Ma- mainly focusing in on that idea of Ebola. And the uh, second episode, I have it written down, but it's not in front of me. We'll, we'll do another one, and if you want to, another after that, uh, let uh, Brother Shepherd on there. Well, this has been a, a busy weekend uh, for us here, up here at the North Valley Church of Christ. We just had our uh, annual gospel meeting. And our main speaker was Brother Ronald Bryant. Brother Ronald Bryant was the uh, used to be the pulpit minister at the Camelback Church of Christ for many years, many decades, and uh, highly respected. He still is today. Uh, then he went off to to teach at the uh, uh, Ambridge University, and I think that's in Alabama. And now he's back in Prescott, Arizona, where he's up there uh, helping uh, Brother Mike Scott. Uh, he's filling in in the, the pulpit up there for him. While Mike Scott is going through some chemotherapy, he's uh, got some cancer. We want to keep him in our prayers and everything. He knows it's a struggle. But uh, what I really want us to uh, uh, focus in on is uh, is the work uh, Brother Mike has done. He does that, what do the scriptures say? And, and of course, he preaches up there. He, he's a, a, many people respect him and appreciate him. And it's nice uh, to have uh, Brother Ronald, Br- Ronald Bryant up there helping out with that, uh, that effort. He was our main speaker, and he, the, the theme was uh, stepping out in for the right relationship with God. It was all about time. And it was a wonderful series of lessons. Uh, each night, Brother Ron Bryant brought us a, a lesson and on Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, Friday night, uh, before him, was Theo Jones, who was also one of the preachers from Camelback. Saturday night, we also had uh, uh, Ryan Bittekopper, who is the current pulpit minister at Camelback. And Brother Ronald Bryant. And then Sunday morning on the, the class and the lessons, Brother Ronald Bryant finished up the series for us. And I'm putting those on DVD. And I'm also planning on, if the elders allow me, uh, putting these videos on a, on a YouTube channel that I'm setting up for the congregation. I'm hopeful that that will go through. And we'll be able to do those things for the folks here uh, on the radio program as well as uh, around the valley. They can all take a look at that stuff. All right. Well, let's. Let's get forward with our lesson for this this uh, afternoon. Again, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7. We'll be finishing up the series. And if you remember from last week, we were looking at verses, uh, let's see, what is it, 1 through 12, where we had that beginning where it's that pretentious judging and then the asking and the seeking and the knocking and the bookend with the golden rule. And uh, in here, Jesus is talking about a true seeking righteousness surpasses a pretentious righteousness. And that is, that is so true. A religion of pretense or uh, of pretentious, pretentious righteousness is one that is not based on truth, and it doesn't seek the truth, but only demands the truth. And so we're going to look at the rest of the, uh, chapter 7. We'll see there at the end that the only true and sustaining religion is built on the rock, solid foundation, which is Jesus Christ. All other approaches to religion is only pretense by comparison and are built upon that shifting sand of human doctrine. So let's uh, let's look at, or let's read verses 13 and 14. We're going to be continuing through this chapter. Verses 13 and 14, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Again, here Jesus is setting forth the goal of true religion. Uh, religion is not merely going through the motions or keeping ritual. True righteousness is moving toward a goal. And here is the end to which we are asking, seeking, and knocking. Note, Jesus begins with enter. So we've already done all those things, and we've knocked. The door has been opened. 
But if we're truly speaking the truth, we will enter through the narrow way, won't we? We'll be looking for that. Remember what Jesus said. He said, I am the door. He is where we need to be knocking. He is the source of all truth. And I think there's really two possibilities in life and religion. There are always the right way, and it's the opposite, the wrong way. Whenever you are faced with much more than one possibility, you have to make a choice. You have to. There's no way around it. Jesus so uh, then describes these choices available to us. He says, one is a broad and seemingly easy, uh, easily traveled road, and the other is a narrow and more difficult road. One is the way of the majority, the other is traveled by few. One is easily seen because it is broad and obvious, the other must be sought in order to find it. One ends up at a wide gate, the other a narrow gate. One leads to destruction, one leads to life. Jesus is showing that not everyone will be in eternity with him. Some people do not believe in hell and think that God will will one day just bring everyone who has ever lived into hell. Some Some think that if you are religious, you'll make it no matter what religion you are. But Jesus says that you must follow a certain road to reach the destination you want. It must be found. You have to find the path. You may have a map, but the path is hard to find like you know, whenever you're trying to find certain trails here in Arizona to go walking or biking, just because you have a map, you still have to seek it out to get there and then knock and you enter in. But it's not a broad, easy way to find. You've got to search for it. It's not see, just dropped into your lap. God wants you to be a truth seeker, not merely a pew warmer, if you know what I mean. So seeking the way to life rather than following the way of destruction there in verses 13 and 14. Then Jesus moves on to verses 15 and 23. To 23, let's uh, read those two. Here he says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Truth seekers must judge between those claiming to be spiritual guides. Now we find the way to life by asking, seeking, and knocking. Yet we could get the wrong direction. So we have to determine if we have truth or not. Preachers or religious leaders will want to be your guide to religion, but you need to beware of the false prophets. It is possible to get the wrong directions when we go looking for the way of life. Some false prophets wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. These, uh, these are pretense prophets who promote pretense religion. They cannot offer genuine religion because they themselves are not genuine. They only pretend to be. Of what does their sheep's clothing exist of? I mean, we can we can be taken in by you know, denominations who uphold the name of Jesus and do a lot of good in the world, but they're not seeking the truth. I, even even within the churches of Christ, you you, you got to be careful. Many preachers will say, oh, that will, I'll guide you, but they may lead you wrong. Ultimately, you need to look at it this way. Jesus says, I am the way of the truth and the life. He is. No one comes to the Father but by Christ. I, I encourage the folks here at North Valley to uh, 
yeah, I, I want you to listen to my lesson. I want you to be uh, uh, listen carefully as, as best you can. But, you know, search the scriptures to see that these things are so, like the noble Berean. Don't rest your salvation upon me, but upon Christ. All I want to do is encourage folks to study. I want them to think about the text. That's what I want. Does the wolf in sheep's clothing know that they're a wolf, though? Sometimes they don't. They may be teaching false doctrine, and they think it's right. They sincerely believe it to be true. So it's up to each individual to search out the scripture to see if these things are so. You have to be in constant study. A second bit of imagery uh, here. Jesus explains that we might identify them, the false prophets, by their fruit. You can determine what kind of tree uh, is a fig tree, right? Or a vine based on if it's growing grapes or not. You have uh, uh, you have to look at the fruit it's producing. The fruit seems to be, I think here, the doctrines that come forth from these prophets. Some people think that it refers to their works rather than doctrine, but even false prophets have good works to their credit. You've got to look at their doctrine. Besides, Jesus is leading to a judgment scene in verses 21, 22, and 23, in which it is only the will of God and not the good religious works people do that become the criteria for the judgment. In verses 17 to 20, he expands upon that illustration to show that bad trees cannot produce good fruit and vice versa. His application is that false prophets cannot be preaching truth. You will know them by the doctrines that they teach. Again, the asking and the seeking and the knocking are the requirements for us to find the truth that leads to life. We cannot merely accept what a teacher says. We've got to seek out the truth ourselves. But God promises that we can find it. He will not withhold what we need if we are, what, genuine in our search for truth. Be a truth seeker. We are also shown the results of these false prophets, and that is the cutting down of bad trees and the throwing them into the fire. So if you accept their fruit, the destination is going to be the same. Now, verses 21 to 23. Here, Jesus gives us the, uh, the scene of that day of judgment. Not everyone who claims to have a relationship with Jesus will be welcomed into the Father's house. Those who make it uh, are those who will do the will of God. In verse 22, for example, or not example, but in verse 22, Jesus depicts many uh, on that day of judgment are going to claim that they did all kinds of great religious acts in the name of Christ. Prophecy in your name. Did we not prophesy in your name? That is to teach others what Christ taught. But what they were teaching is not from Christ. Yet they claimed it, didn't they? They thought it was, but Christ never said those things. It's really their own opinions and judgments and not Christ, even though they thought it was Christ. Did we not cast out demons in your name? Again, this, I think this is talking about to render good to others by the authority of Christ. But they didn't have the authority of Christ because they're not preaching the truth in his name. Did we not perform many miracles in your name, Peter? Again, this is to do great works to bring glory to Christ, but theirs are lying wonders that do not glorify Christ. Consider all the miracles avowed by uh, different religions throughout the, the ages. What does it really bring glory to Christ if it's not from Christ, if they're not teaching truth? If, what they're, if their so-called miracles are bringing people into a religion that does not teach truth, what good does it do? It doesn't do any good. It doesn't help anybody. And so Jesus' response, response will be that they are not welcomed in his house. I never knew you suggests relationship, a lack of it. Lawlessness was accomplished by these because they perverted the Lord's word and used his own name to advocate their authority and they had none. Now that 
bring us to the end there at verse 23. And now we'll, I want us to look at uh, the last part of this, this thought, and then we'll look at the last few verses. But the last couple of uh, uh, verses, verses 24 to 27, the foundations of true and pretentious religion. Listen to this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So this is the conclusion to the sermon. Therefore, I think, seems to point to uh, the the idea of the conclusion that all that Jesus has said from chapters 5 and 6 and 7, because of the subject matter, these words of mine. There are two possible responses to Jesus' words. This is it. You get a choice. You got two choices. One leads uh, to the wide and broad way. One leads to the narrow way. You can hear them. You can act upon them. You can hear them and not act upon them. And hearing the message of Jesus is insufficient. It's not enough. You must also respond to the words of Christ. Uh, keep your fi- uh, I, I want to turn over and read to you James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses uh, 22 and 24, or to, to 24. Now listen to what James says here. He says, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at himself at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Not just a hearer, but a doer. Not just somebody who looks at the word of God and reads it and says, man, those are good words, and then they move on and go back to their regular point of life, but it doesn't change anything in their life. Not a doer of the word. Hear these words of Christ and act upon these words of Christ. And then again, Jesus uh, uses an illustration to help us to see the consequences of not responding to his teaches. You're either like a wise man or you're like the foolish man. Now, in this uh, illustration, you've got the house, you've got the rocks, you've got the sand, the floods, and the wind. The house is your life. This is the life you're building. This is your whole life here upon earth. It doesn't matter how good the life is. It doesn't matter how beautiful your life is in comparison to uh, anything that Jesus taught. It depends on what are you building it upon. Now, if you're doing it, you know, just you, you could be doing all kinds of good things, giving away your money and feeding the poor and, and helping folk out your whole life. But if you're not building your life upon the teachings of Christ, that is the rock, then you're building your, your life upon the sand, the shifting sands of, well, that's just going to be other teachings or other ideas. I mean, there are a lot of religions out there that, that have nothing to do with Jesus, and they're good folk trying to do good things, wanting to be good people, but they're not built upon the rock. It is unstable sand. And so the floods and the winds, this is judgment, comes, and it checks out the stability of the house's foundation. It's determined by that storm. And so when the storm passes, only the house built on the rock remains. It is not the trials of life, but it is the ultimate test put to the finished house or life. It is the judgment day. How well would you do? Are you a doer of the word? Are you acting upon the words of Christ? Or, or do you just hear it and then you go your own way and do it the other way, the broad way, the way everyone else does, so that there's no persecution or any difficulties and you don't have to worry about following the words of Christ and you can get your political uh, person voted in because, well, they're, they're saying it's okay for homosexuals to be married, despite what the Bible says. You're building upon the sand, not the foundations of Jesus Christ. And then verses 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. That word amazed, 
means dumbfounded. They could hardly believe what they heard. The doctrine he spoke and the way that he communicated them, it was unamazing. They were dumbfounded. <clears throat> and what really got the crowd's attention was the authority with which he spoke. The deity of Jesus seemed to show through his teaching. Their standard of measurement was their own teachers and their own pride. These teachers were often negative and condemning. They were often inconsistent in their doctrine and were occasionally found out to be hypocritical and not genuine. They would argue about petty things and neglect weightier matters of righteousness. And they gave little meat to feed the soul. Jesus spoke with confidence, and every word was consistent. He cuts to the chase and attempts to put people on the right track. He's not playing at religion. He is genuine, and this genuineness comes shining through all that he says. We need to continue to read and reread the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus spoke it. I believe that it will help us to see what kind of people we need to be if we're going to be acceptable to God. It will help us to avoid hypocrisy in trying to practice our religion just to get man's approval or to be politically correct, which seems to be infiltrating the church today. It will enable us to be less judgmental and more helpful to those around us. It will remind us to seek truth and to be aware of false teaching so that we will examine everything that is presented to us as truth. And it will awaken us to the realities of judgment to come. What will Jesus say to us on that final day? Will he say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness? Or will he welcome us into his eternal abode? Well, it depends on what we have done with, not our lives, his word. What will you do with his words? When you hear them, are you just going to say, those are, those are good words, I like those, and then move on with your life? Or is it going to penetrate the heart and change who you are? That's the intention. It's the power of God. Do you hear the words and think, man, those are good moral standings, but man, if I, if I go around teaching or preaching or believing that, I'll, I'll never get elected into office. I've, I've got to be more accepting to the homosexual uh, movement out there. What does Paul say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. I love the Sermon on the Mount. This is just the everything. So many things can be pointed back to this. It is the greatest sermon ever. I love it. And I think we need to study it more often. A yearly, perhaps. Maybe we always need to read it every couple of weeks just to keep it in our mind. Because this, if you want to be a true disciple of Christ, this is what you need to be right here. Your righteousness needs to surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. Chapter 5, verse 20, the very beginning. That's what Jesus wants of us. This is the way we need to be. His words need to penetrate our heart always, changing who we are. And we are not to be like the people of the world, but we are to be the people of God. And that means that we die to self and we live for Christ. Well, that is it. That's the Sermon on the Mount. I finally got through it. It took me a long time here on the radio program to get through that, but... I really wanted to spend time through many of these uh, parts to hopefully that I could bring this to, to light or give you something to think about. You know, don't take my words and, and run with them. Look at the text. See if these things are so. Know the truth because it is only the truth found in Christ that will set you free. And no man can do that. Only Christ. And you have to hear his words and act on them. You've got to Read his words and be a doer of it and not merely a hearer only. Because faith without works, as James says, is dead. Your faith will show forth in what you do and the change in your life. Well, I have a, this is a, one of the rarities of, of the radio program. I've got a minute left, a little about a minute and 
20 seconds left. Wow, what do I do with it? Well, I want to encourage you to go to our website. Uh, go to www.nvcot.net, and in that website, you can find all sources of, uh, of resources and, and links and, and whatnot. You'll find a, a link over to What Do the Scriptures Say from Mike Gotten with his uh, workings there. You can uh, uh, go there and look at the many videos they have on their website. You can click on that radio mic. That'll take you to the blog site for our radio program. And there you can listen to the, not only this show, but all of our previous episodes also. And I, I encourage you to do that. I want you to leave comments. I would love for you to send in requests or questions so we can answer those here on this program. That's really the goal of, the, of this radio program. It may take a while for us to get there, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get to it. And so I encourage you to get to those websites. Let us know what you think. And uh, I want to also... Um, encourage you to read your Bibles daily. Open it up. This is the word of life right here. Don't just listen to me or listen to other preachers, although they may sound good. Get into the word. Study and know the truth. I want to thank you all for being with me this day and this afternoon. I, ho I hope and pray that you'll have a blessed day and that the, the weather will continue to cool and we can all uh, have a good time and that we may uh, be encouraged and the Lord may bless each and every one of us. But above all, I want to thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has given us this time and this opportunity. And every breath we have is a blessing from him. So let us always make the most of every moment he has given us. Thank you.